Yes, my, my name is Paul Garner. I'm, I'm based at the University in Gloucestershire. Um, I'm quite new to this world, so I started in my position there a year ago. Um, and prior to that, I was living and working in the French Alps, um, running my own business, which was a coaching centre in, in Val d'Isere. So, I'm quite new to academia. Um, and what I'd like to share with you today is um, the research I did for my master's uh, degree at the University of Worcester. So, we're going to be looking at coach learning, coach education, and how a community of practice can potentially drive learning within that world. Um, I deliberated as to how I'd start this, this presentation off, and the obvious place to start is, is the beginning, um, and to talk you through what I did, but I actually think there's some value in, um, in sharing some of the findings of the study with you before I go into what I did. So, um, this actually involves you doing some thinking, some reading, so I hope you're not, uh, I hope it's not too early in the morning for you, but I've got, some, I've got some quotes here that have come out of the, the findings, so out of the thematic analysis from the transcripts, that this will become obvious as we go through the presentation, but just, um, if you'd like to just have a little look at some of these quotes, by all means, discuss what you think with people next to you. Um, it might mean absolutely nothing to you, especially if you've got no background in skiing. Um, but it might give you a sense of where we're going. Okay, so I'll just give you a minute, because I know we're on a time schedule. And perhaps consider those two questions. Very broad. Is there anything that strikes you about the quotes? Okay. And perhaps more specifically, do you see any value for coach learning coming out of those quotes? Um, any winter sports enthusiasts here? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So very quickly, has anybody read anything that strikes them as interesting? It doesn't matter if you haven't. Yes? Yeah. You share it with us. Well, it's about does your tone of voice uh, come across uh, when you're slightly nervous, uh, going across a dodgy piece of uh, off piece or whether you're rock climbing or, or, or doing anything else, it's a, it's a Sorry, very interesting question. What's, what's your name? I'm Douglas. Douglas. So why, why does that strike you as interesting in, in, in terms of coach learning? Well, it interests me in terms of personal experience. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and, and, and if you like, uh, being a, a leader of a group of people, if you like. And do you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All or, right. Or uh, do you uh, try and uh, come up with a tricky situation? Okay, so there's not necessarily a right and wrong to that, is there? Correct. It, it depends very much on the situation, so yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll possibly come back to that. Yes, Paul, as well. Yeah. Hi, Paul. Um, and the first part of this question is I've noticed myself that the last two sessions have been more fun, and you kind of assume that that's going to be the student, and then it transpires that it's the coach. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, well, the last thing we should be thinking about is whether it's fun for the coach or not. Right. Okay. Do you think that is important though? Well it is, it, it is, but it's not normally what the focus is all on the learner. Yeah. Um, whereas I think it's quite right actually the focus should be on the coach so the coach enjoys the experience as well. Yeah, yeah, and that could potentially impact the learner. Yeah. If the coach exactly. is having a good time. Yeah. And perhaps if the, if the learner's having a good time, that's why the coach is having a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else that anybody wanted to share with us? We'll come back to these in a minute. I've got two here both of them, um, refer to how positive communication is, yeah. rather than just having the knowledge about certain technical aspects of the sport that you coach in, to actually be able to communicate that and then, yeah, but they, there's two here that both kind of highlight that. Yeah, okay. Again, we'll perhaps come back to them towards the end, yeah. So communication is a big, a big sort of theme. Did you want to add anything or no? Uh, yeah, I have one about... about another coach um, who is perceived as, as by other people to be like this cold, close of personality and the coach was reading the article recognizes some elements of 
but he takes his own character in it and sees how it can affect his his coaching abilities. Yeah, so almost a realization of his personality and how that affects mm. how that affects his coaching. Yeah. Okay. So I just thought it might help you frame what I'm talking about if you've got those quotes in front of you. <coughs> so if I just run through my story, really. Um, so this is before I came into academia. Um, I was studying for my master's degree, but I was still working and living in the Alps, working with my own business with um, between 15 and 20 coaches who were all highly qualified, um, internationally qualified, working in France. And they came to me and I went to them and we had a sort of a mutual interest in developing them. Um, so they had no formal qualifications to go on to. They'd finished all that. They'd finished their education, but they still wanted to get better. And they recognised, and I recognised, that their technical understanding was very high. So their understanding of the sport was very high, um, and their performance was very high, technical performance. But their people skills, although the, their people skills were good, that's, that was potentially the area that we could develop. And as a school, if we ever had any complaints, which we didn't get many, if we did have complaints, that they would usually be around these areas of communication skills, whether the instructor or the coach had read the client, whether they'd built a good relationship. Um, and when I started to read the literature around coach education, as somebody new coming into this world, I, I found quite a lot of evidence there to suggest that holes within coach education usually are usually in these areas. So coach, coach education tends to focus on um, the sport specific technical knowledge and how we, how we help people to become better communicators and some of these slightly more ephemeral skills that is not such an easy thing to do. Um, so uh, in my reading, I came across a paper by Cote and Gilbert, um, two scholars from Canada. Some of you may be familiar with them, may not. And they took coaching and they tried to define what an expert coach is. What knowledge does an expert coach need? Um, so I, if I paint a little bit of a mental picture for you here, if you imagine, um, if I pick a sport that, that most people can relate to, so if you imagine a football coach who's perhaps played to a high level, has a high level of professional knowledge, a high level of technical and tactical knowledge, knows the game inside out, but struggling to have a team, a cohesive team, um, has continual fights and heated arguments around selection, lots of anger within the players. Um, there's a hierarchy there with the coach here and the players down below bit of a barrier in terms of communication. There's a rumour mill that runs around the club, there's cliques within the club, but the coach doesn't really see that as his issue, he sees that there's maybe a few bad apples in the team, it's perhaps the state of young people today. So nothing changes, that, that's how he works and people have to put up with it or, or move on. Okay, so if you consider that situation, such a coach, um, we can argue probably doesn't have an expert knowledge, an expert level of knowledge in terms of his, his interpersonal skills. Okay, so his ability to work with a team, his ability to coach those individuals and get them to work together is lacking. Similarly, his intrapersonal knowledge, so by that we mean his ability to be introspective, self-awareness, ability to reflect on what's happening around him is perhaps lacking as well. All right, so he's not, he's not seeing this as an issue that he can have an effect on, it's somebody else's problem. However, we might be able to argue that his professional knowledge, his understanding of the sport is, is very high and he has that expert knowledge. Okay? But that professional knowledge is of limited use if he doesn't have these other two types of knowledge to facilitate the delivery of that professional knowledge. Um, so this became a, a model, if you like, for, for how I saw my, my instructors that I was working with. And I could see they had high levels of professional knowledge, but at times the other two were lacking. So that became our mission. How are we going to improve 
that aspect of their performance. Um, not an easy thing to do, so I went back to the literature and I came across a study that, strange enough, was, was conducted by a world, an ex-World Cup skier in Canada, who's now a professor at the School of Applied Kinetics in Ottawa, Diane Culver. Um, and the, the, there's a dearth of studies looking into this in sports coaching. This was the standout study. And Diane had used a, cult, um, a community of practice to try and educate the ski coaches that she was working with. Um, so at the time I knew very little about community of practice, so I, had, I looked into the literature on that. I should imagine it's a term that, you, that you're familiar with, communities of practice. We talked to Dave about it at the beginning of um, the morning. In its purest sense, um, Wenger talked about communities of practice fulfilling a requirement to fulfil these three conditions. Okay, so he talked about the need for mutual engagement, so members of the community are there through their own free will, there's no obligation to be a part of that community. Um, there's a joint enterprise, so they have a, they have a shared goal, they have an objective that they're trying to to achieve, and they looked at to create a shared repertoire, if you like, a resource that comes out of that interaction. So, interestingly, I think in the first presentation, there's, there's perhaps a community of practice of tennis players travelling around Europe, as you, as you said. Um, we arguably this could, we could be members of a community of practice at this symposium looking to to develop our, our knowledge and create a shared repertoire in terms of the presentations and the, and the materials we take away. Um, now, it, as I said, in its purest sense, a community of practice is very informal, it's unmediated, it's organic and it just happens. Um, now, for that concept to be of real use in, in coach education, Culver demonstrated that we need to put somebody in there to lend some structure to that. So rather than leaving it to chance, so if I go back to my ski coaches, rather than leaving them to educate one another in the pub, which was what, what was happening, they'd go and have a drink after work and they might chat a little bit about what had happened and they might learn. By putting a facilitator into that community and giving it some structure, then Culver showed that we can actually create a rich environment for learning. So, that, so that's what we what's, what we tried to do. Um, Colbert's study really showed the role of the consultant facilitator and showed how that did provide a rich environment, but it didn't really show whether the intra and interpersonal knowledge, going back to my previous slide, um, it didn't show whether whether that we could develop those two types of knowledge. It really it seemed to really be generating an environment to, to share professional knowledge. So the study I undertook really wanted to explore... Perhaps I should have taken that today. Uh, really wanted to explore whether we could develop intra and interpersonal knowledge through this facilitated, cultivated community of practice um, that we are engaged in. So... The study, how it unfolded, um, we met as a group of coaches once a week over the course of six weeks and we sat in a room around a table for about two hours and we talked about what we did. Uh, and I invited the coaches to come to each meeting with something to share. So either something that had gone particularly well that week or in that season in their coaching that they thought others might learn from possibly something that they, they'd seen as a real problem, or maybe even an idea that they wanted to try, but they, they perhaps hadn't had the confidence to do so, and they wanted to discuss it with their peers before they went out and tried it with their clients. Um, and over the course of those six weeks, there was some really powerful learning that came out um, of the conversations we had. I, I facilitated the discussion, so I chaired it. Um, that was a challenge in itself. <coughs> but where, where it took us, um, you, 
can see from, from some of the quotes, and these are just a selection of what came out of those meetings, but it did give us an opportunity to look at some areas that these people had never really considered. They'd been on level one, level two, level three, level four. They'd been through sometimes five or six years of training to get to where they were at, yet they hadn't really considered some of these issues that were having quite a major impact on their success in their, in their job. Um, so, before I put that up, if we go back to the quotes now that you've got, do they resonate with the idea of intrapersonal knowledge, interpersonal knowledge. Can you see any there that you think, well actually that is, that's really showing that this person's developing a level of self-awareness that they perhaps didn't have? I'm here. Yeah, there's one here, um, I've been experimenting a lot. I haven't had an awful lot of success. I'm trying to change. So clearly, you know, that person's aware of themselves. Yeah. Whether they should change or not is another issue. Yeah. yeah, well that, that person was a, a fascinating coach to work with. So came in at the beginning of the six weeks and had quite a, quite a closed mindset. Had a philosophy that, that was steeped in professional knowledge. In all his sessions were, were built around what it said in the manual. And he was constantly getting frustrated when people couldn't do what he wanted them to do. I know what it should look like. I just can't get them to do it. Um, you know, and there were several of us in the room thinking, oh, that doesn't sound great. But because of the environment we had, rather than telling, there were lots of questions and lots of thinking. And by the end of the six weeks, that individual, that was probably weak. What, what does it say? Does it say GT3. GT3, okay, so that's, they, 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 they termed the meetings group therapy. That's group therapy three. By the time he got to group therapy six, um, he, he'd had a, a, a huge realization that his coaching philosophy was needed, needed to be re, revisited, really. Um, and, and he started to work with people in, in a way that put their goals and what they wanted at the top of the tree and what he wanted a bit lower down. And all of a sudden, he started to enjoy his work a lot more. So he figures in quite a few of the quotes. Is there anything else that you think is particularly interesting in those quotes? Yeah, there's a coach here who felt that he was perceived by other people to be close and came across to be a cold, which um, they wasn't 100% motivated, which would be, as a coach, to be close as a coach, you'd be quite worried, really. You wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> that, that particular coach was being particularly self-critical. But I think what's interesting there is just the level of self-awareness. So the, the level of intrapersonal knowledge is starting to think and to reflect. Um, and that was a big journey for, for, some of the, for some of the people involved in this project. They never really, never really thought about themselves and how their behavior had an impact on the people they were working with. Um, so that was, a, that was a big learning journey for him. Um, in summary, um, what did I find? This is what I found. Uh, I ended up looking at two areas really, how they learned <coughs> and what they learned. Okay, so, so much of the learning came from storytelling and there is a growing body of literature around storytelling in coach education and the power and value of, of sharing stories within a community. Um, the reflective conversations that we had within the group and interestingly, the impact of role frames, so the impact of the coach's philosophy, when they came into the, into the project, had people with different philosophies, and that had an impact on how they learned. So it took a while to break down the closed <coughs> mindset of that particular individual, whereas some of the other coaches were a lot more open right from the word go. So raising their awareness of how closed or open they were to other people's opinions, that was learning in itself. And there was strong evidence, as you can see from some of the quotes, that this approach, it did develop their interpersonal and their interpersonal skills. So, um, I suppose uh, 
my my feeling about this is that I, I want to try and get some structure into in communities of practice within coach education as a way to uh, to develop this, this side of a coach's practice. <coughs> so if you've got uh, if, if there's anything else you want to bring up about the quotes, then go ahead. I'm welcome. Um, if you've got any questions, then uh, you know hopefully I, I can learn something from your questions. Thank you, Paul.